So that's really nice to be with you again. Uh, I will take up from where I left off last time. And the last time what we did was actually what Anna said. We just had a brief introduction to contact, but actually we had a little contact with what contact is. And in fact, what I tried to do back then uh, was to define a different contact ecologies thinking or essentially trying to give the impression or the idea that every contact uh, situation is unique by itself, but still we can cluster them around the specific socio-historical uh, background. So there can be, for instance, places of contact where two different people come together to you know, uh, who have different linguistic backgrounds come together for a very brief uh, period of time only for trade or so, and then this can really create its own contact ecology and the outcomes, obviously, or some people rush into another person's territory, people's territory, to either to rule or to dominate or to cohabit, and this can last for quite a long, and it has its own contact uh, situations, some of which we are going to talk also again uh, next time, hopefully face to face. Uh, what we had then, of course, was an idealization of how to approach linguistically to any context situation. So what would contact investigation be like? Obviously, no matter what, we should never forget about the ecology that the contact happens in, in, inside it. So the histo socio historical background is essentially a must to understand what contact, uh, how contact has happened, how it, can, how it started. And in fact, when I say how it started, we essentially mention the actuation problem, like how a linguistic variant enters into uh, the pool and it doesn't really get lost stochastically, which means that how it essentially propagates over a sizable community. And these are all answers that could be potentially answered in any context situation. And only so when we consider the structural and typological factors or the compatibility between the languages that are in contact. And only then we can have a unique understanding of what the contact outcomes is. This is very good to say, but the situation is that in almost always we end up with the contact outcomes and then try to reconstruct, reverse engineer the history and whatever has happened. And today I'm going to look at the challenges that we can have, obviously, not forgetting the fact that Historical linguistics is the art of making the best use of bad data, which essentially applies, obviously, to our case as well. Uh, and now what I'm going to be talking about is essentially about the data that are and that aren't there. So what we can do, how we can find them, what challenges are out there. Um, while trying to do so, essentially, it's going to be more like providing you with my own personal experience and how I have learned in this last couple of years while I'm working on this. Um, if nothing makes sense, I hope you will have some good time. Uh, and I go, shoot. Uh, so while doing this, of course, because uh, I, I work on a specific contact ecology, that is a place where there were essentially people that we know living into which some people, well, people call them us, uh, moved in and either forcefully or happily, which essentially created its own bilingual population, which essentially propagated over a sizable community, so is the idea goes. And in the end, what we have is essentially a unique linguistic variety that we have that has been quite a lot influenced from this uh, invading language that is called Turkish. And essentially, it differentiates itself from its closest kin that we can really reconstruct those people at the far back. Um, now, when we look at the historical uh, or the, the linguistic context as such, it's a very interesting thing. But what we essentially see is from a very, very narrow point when we look at the story of what context has happened, essentially we look at it with the binocular. While it tries to show a lot, it just still shows us a very limited amount of information, very limited landscape, basically. All we can see is, yes, there is a little bit of contact out there, there is a little contact variety, and we kind of suspect that there is a language with which it was in contact, and how are we going to make sense of all these things? And what happened essentially is the question that we have to answer, or at least we feel like we have to answer. Now, trying to schematize this a little bit more, what I have is like at one point in time, so now, we observe in one language, call it language A, 
that there is one phenomenon, one trait, or the absence of some trait, whatever it is called. Let's call it an why. And the moment you want to do something about the contact or any investigation, you have to compare it to something else. So there has to be some variety or at least some stage of it in the remote past where this why didn't really exist or it existed in a different place or in, in a different shape or it didn't exist at all. And then we have to construct kind of trajectory in between the two. So the X became Y, whether some absence became presence or some X became Y and how it happened. Well, magic, that's for the most part of history, that was it. But what we are going to be looking at is how an external factor that is in another language, which we can call language beta, which we believe has why or we feel as why, somehow get into contact, obviously not the language itself, but the speakers with the speakers of the other language and suddenly provided the other language with why. So now what I'm going to be talking about is going to be only about this three what basically what challenges are we find in this trivet and I'm going to give you some information unfortunately there will be a lot of data uh, if you don't like data in the sense that linguistic data um, I hope you won't find it really boring uh, looking at this diagram what we see is essentially that linguistic linguistic investigation of a context situation is both diachronic obviously you have to look at the historical facts and it's typological that is contrastive you have to contrast three things over here and while context situation any contact investigation lies at the intersection of at least these two it also bears the weaknesses of the both types just like in typological studies every single language that we have is a potential challenge for any statement universal that we have so is the case in language context situation that in every single piece of information that we have pertinent to the history of language alpha is a potential challenge for any hypothesis that we have for that one. And for the diachronic studies, I shouldn't really be talking. Marika has talked about all the challenges what the, the, any diachronic study can provide you with. Um, as I said, it's going to be the challenges with the data that are and that aren't in this trivet and how we can try to overcome these challenges, at least some friendly advice. And while doing this, I will look at obviously the contact in Asia Minor. That's where I live today. Um, the very first thing that I have seen in while I was working in these things is essentially when we look at the time when we see the outcome or think that we see the outcome of contact as why, the very first thing that I always ask myself is, wait a minute, is what I see as why is really real? Is that really the case? Is it really part of what I see, what, what, what the grammar is? Or is it some hapax phenomenon? Or is something really just have been noted mistakenly or whatsoever? This is obviously nothing to do with linguistics and uh, language contact only. It's pertinent to every single linguistic investigation, obviously, but I will just try to illustrate this from context situations. Now, first, there are all those things that we see as outcomes of contact. So the things that we see is actually like the things that you can really write or that you can really hear, such as words and affixes or sounds for that matter, they immediately declare their origin. So you don't really have to be that much of a, um, an investigator to really know them. So we know like in all these languages like Pontic, Cappadocian or Anatolian Arabic, there is a lot of verbs coming from Turkish, obviously because of the contact that we have. So the same word to start, Vashla, we see it in all the three languages. In Pontic Greek, it realizes as Vashla Evo, in Cappadocian, Vashla Dejo, and in Anatolian Arabic, Vashla Meshsawa. So for these, you don't really have to be uh, a magician to know what exactly it is. While they are potentially interesting, for instance, how these verbs happen to be in three different guises, in three different languages. So they, as if you look at the red part, all these red parts are from Turkish. So while Pontic Greek just uses the verb root, in Cappadocian we use the past form of the verbs. And in Anatolian Arabic, it is the participle, the started form of these ones. So these are the nice information, the questions that you can further pursue, obviously. Um, but it's what I wanted to say is that for these type of things that you see, it's already given that there has been some contact. And when you plot these, in fact, on the history, you see two linguistic areas. Basically, all these languages that you see in a square 
have the the type that is the second form as in the Cappadocian one with the the forms that results all the way from uh, Serbo-Croatian to Albanian or all the western part of Asia Minor and the Balkans basically and the eastern you go they become just the mush type the participle part so uh, plotting them are very nice very good and other things that you can also see is like some other dialects of Arabic do not really work the same way so they are a lot more resistant to the verbs to be borrowed as verbs from Turkish so what they do in fact is that they just incorporate these Turkish verbs into their root pattern morphology in Semitic languages probably you all know there are consonants and you insert vowels so that you change in tense or aspect of modality whatsoever so in Azik Arabic in Shirnak another village which is essentially only 40 kilometers from number three we never see any verbs with these ones and in fact all the verbs that they have is quite resistant so they always are incorporated into the stems of their own so a verb like kapat which means to close in Turkish it becomes gapat in the present tense and igapat in the past tense that for the first person or to register kayat is the kayat or igayat so they really change and they take out stripe off the consonants from Turkish and put them these are interesting questions that you can really ask why as does this and not Sasson Arabic what, what has happened um, but this is not the question I will I will come to the point very soon now the things that we see go with the descending order in a sense we also have quite a lot of other um, contact phenomena in Asia Minor such as the thing that we see in Cappadocian or Arab Kir, where they have this thing called um, emphatic uh, reduplication in effect what you do is like you take the root of an adjective you just reduplicate one part of it just the initial consonant and the vowel and then put it as a prefix but only so with the help of oh sorry with the help of an um, a pathetic consonant over here so in Cappadocian kalo which means good simply becomes cup kalo very good or aspro becomes apaspro and the arab kir armenian you have shahed which becomes shap shahed or chipcharmak snow white uh, now we know that these two are the only varieties that are non-turkic that can really do this we can immediately point to the fact that turkish which both in all turkic or modern turkish has this clearly also declares their origin immediately and you can also just write whatever has happened immediately right at the point so if you have a rule as such the first initial consonant and vowel has to be copied onto an underspecified consonant vowel prefix uh, from a set of sp which really distributes stochastically both in turkish and any other dialects that i have shown and that is essentially the thing that these languages also employ now how it happened is another question when we can ask it's not only that these two dialects Greek and Armenian dialects use their native lexicon to do this emphatic reduplication but their lexicon also has a lot of already reduplicated forms from Turkish like the Turkish cup kermes over here which means high red from red exists in Greek as such cup kermes because they didn't have the the color name is kermes already or all these are from Turkish and the Armenians was Ipi, superb or Bombok, terrible or Mosmor, they are all from Turkish. So you can already speculate that probably these things that we can call as a morpheme and or a rule, whatever you call it, entered probably into these dialects through these words that have already been borrowed. The interesting upshot is you see these things and they already declare their origin. Now, there are also things that we don't really see, but we feel that they are through contact. And these, we can talk about the losses and additions, obviously. Um, we don't really see anything, but we think that it's potentially contact. And the more it decreases our vision on this event, the more speculative the contact becomes. That's what I was going to say. So in modern Greek, what we know is, um, it differentiates between two aspects in the future tense 
Uh, you can be talking about the continuous action with 9a, paragraph 4, which means I'll be writing, but also you can just use a perfective one, paragraph so that I will write. That's a non continuous action. Um, then it was the case almost the whole history of Greek to the extent that these verbs have been reshaped in the early medieval Greek. Uh, what we do, however, see in Pontic Greek is that one form is completely lost. So the imperfective form, the perfective form, sorry, that is shaded over here, doesn't really exist. So all you end up is thagrafo, basically, which is ambiguous between I'll be writing or I'll write. Um, now, how did it happen is another question. Now, there is a whole array of literature out there which immediately attaches it to the contact with the neighboring languages, Turkish and Laz, none of which make the distinction between the perfective and imperfective in the future. Uh, now the question suddenly pops up. Huh, OK, since I don't see it, should I really believe what I see? Is it just so? Now there are other things, of course, that also create this question. So for instance, again, uh, in Sasson Arabic uh, in the southeast, there is this indefinite marker, uh, ma, which is a suffix on the noun itself, like kelp ma means a dog, uh, as opposed to kelp, which means the dog. Uh, the standard assumption is that it has become such an indefinite marker, this ma, simply because it has been, Sasson Arabic has been in contact with Kurdish and Western Armenian, uh, both of which have an indefinite article that is also a suffix to the noun itself, as in Kurdish, deriyek or dagma. Um, the interesting thing over here is that Sasson Arabic doesn't really borrow any morpheme. That's not necessarily anything. So what we know about this is that Sasson Arabic, or at least the speakers of Sasson Arabic, looked at the uh, Kurdish and the Western Armenian forms, and then they grammaticalized, so to speak, or transferred the function of indefiniteness to something indefinite already in its own native lexicon, such as ma or what, or something. It depends on the situation. Um, we don't have an answer how these things happen or in under what circumstances these things happen, but I'm just citing a literature, but already the questions, the question mark is getting bigger and bigger. The same thing you could also say about the functional transfer, the, the functional transfer for the copula in Troyo, which is an Assyri um, which goes back to classical Syriac, basically. It's an Aramaic language that's spoken in the Southeast again, where we know that classical Arabic didn't really have copular forms. They didn't really mark M is R, but Troyo, the modern descendant, has it. Yo, yo, you have to add the last one. And the standard assumption again is that it has developed under the contact with the neighboring languages, the Kurdish and Sasson Arabic, both of which have it as obligatory. Um, Copular forms. And in fact, for many people, the story goes as such that it's the Kurdish that provided the morpheme to Sasson Arabic. So the Sasson Arabic one was borrowed from Kurdish. Whereas in the Troyo, the copula has been again grammaticalized from a pronoun of classical Syriac, which is a who, which means she or he. So they started to use this as a copular form simply because that it happened under the contact as if it would never happen be without. Um, so these are the things that we feel and again what we have is just some speculative reasons like looking around the, the environment okay I see one thing in this language and another thing that emerged okay this is context jumping to the conclusions with the things that we see, the conclusions are quite easy to, to, to make concrete. But with things that we feel, we don't really see, things. the question mark becomes big. The question mark becomes even bigger about the things that we do suspect. We don't even have a bigger feeling about them. And here what I mean is essentially the patterns or rules that people have been thinking about. Um, to make it, to make what I have in my mind concrete, I am going to give you the example. So time after time, people have been citing that the peculiar Turkish word order invaded Greek. So you can see it from the early 20th century all the way to the 2000s. So essentially it's like something that is a self, it's, it's like a prophecy that 
everyone takes it for granted. Under the most sensible reading, which I know as a speaker of Turkish, that the Turkish word order is OV, where the objects precede the verb, and the verb object is essentially the Greek form, that is the thing. So what happens is like the Greek form, Greek word order, verb object becomes OV, like the Turkish one. And saying this is one thing, and whether it is real or not is another thing. So the statement goes for the examples in 19 A and B, which essentially the idea is that while the O order in 19 A, where the cat caught the mouse, mouse, just like in English, was the standard order, O V order has become because Turkish has dominated its word order. So ipseka tombandiko biesini, which in 19 B. And obviously the statement goes that this happens because the Turkish word order is essentially an OV in the basic neutral word order as in 20. Um, this is this sells good, this sells well, but whether it is real or not is an entirely different question. And to be able to do so, you really have to delve into this. Like, wait, OK, this is a statement and I have to challenge this. Now, what you can do, for instance, to do this is like, OK, sit back and look in the data. Is it real? So then you can do a corpus research. So this is the old corpus that I have could call like it's around 100,000 words, which is very, very small, but it, it's something I mean. And it incorporates data from 1862 to 1946. And an interesting thing emerges over here when you look at all these lexical verbs with the VO order, no matter where the S is, it's almost like 87.4%. And OV, which people think has dominated, is even less than the modern Greek word order here, today's with the today's criteria for today's corpus. So you would see more OV orders in modern Greek today than in Cappadocian or in, in this dialect, in fact. Now, this is a bit of suspicion. So clearly there is not much of a thing to say over here. And in fact, you can also delve into the data even further and look at all these places where essentially you would see the most basic word order. Like if you're going to look at a word order of some language, these are essentially the places where you could look, such as out of blue utterances. And one place to look at is introduction to the narratives. We have a lot of narrative clauses with narrative narratives in which the initial sentences always start with an SVO or SO, um, which they involve verb and an object. Or the generic statements, like things that refer to the eternal truths, like the sun orbits the earth or the dogs eat meat, whatsoever, or any question or any answer to all focus questions like what's happening or what happened, where you don't really emphasize any of the elements and the like. And when you really single these things out from the corpus, what you essentially get of is anything that's pertinent to these three criteria is VO. It can be VSO or SVO. So when then what you can say is that, okay, this language probably is a VO language still. There is nothing about the uh, all Venus over here. But then Dawkins, the very, very first person who threw the stone into the well, obviously it must stem from somewhere. Like, why did he say? What the optic illusion uh, stems, I can just skip that one. The optic illusion comes from, in fact, the weak coupler in couplers in predicational structures. So what happens in these dialects is that they have developed weak couplers. Like Amazar, they have the emphatic ones, as in 23b, and then they have the non-emphatic ones, ni. And the non-emphatic ones always attach to the predicate as a suffix, as a enclitic, so to speak. They have to lean onto something, a heavy marker, whatever. Um, so when you look at those things, essentially the use of these um, weak copular structures is overwhelmingly more, obviously, as you see in 79%, as opposed to the VO order in 21% in all the corpus again. Um, so then probably this thing have kind of contaminated the idea. Okay, there are lots of verb, so you can call it a verb, the copulas that are essentially coming after, so to speak, the object, whatever else you can call it, in a predicational structure. And if this is so much and it contaminates. There is nothing really in, in the lexical verbs like eat or do whatsoever. They still are very, very much Greek, even more Greek than modern Greek, in fact. 
now the problem is the same result also we see in any other dialect that we have in Rupontic, Romeca, or Cappadocian is exactly the same picture and almost the same numbers in corpora that I don't have to really walk you through. Now then the question comes, okay, you can just skip this. Maybe Dawkins has in mind is that, okay, not necessarily the lexical words, but the weak copula is in fact from Turkish. That is essentially Turkish is dominating the word order in the copular structures. In other words, is this due to contact with Turkish? Possibly then. While I would really love to answer this so much in this very presentation, I think I will leave this for the next time. So to see what other possibilities, what other possible explanations can pop up. Just take it for the time being as a coming soon. Uh, then what we have done over here is like, wait, what I see is not real. Um, quite a lot of examples I have seen in my life, in, in, in my research, obviously. One other thing was this statement. The question particle ma in one of the Greek dialects is the Turkish question particle ma. In Turkish, we mark yes, no questions with a question marker. Like when you want to say, did you eat? You add something at the very end of the sentence. Did you eat me? Uh, which is employed at the end of the question. So the statement immediately comes and then you can check. OK, there was no question marking in Greek at one point and then Turkish came into scene and then they developed this ma. Good. Here. Uh, this is the dialect of Chuhuri that they had in mind. Uh, and an example uh, in 24 here, the fruit ripened ma. And the analogy over there in 25, the Turkish one the here, fruit ripened mu. So um, the interesting thing is it appears again in the corpora that we have only in 6% of all the questions that you have. So it's a very minimal way of saying this. The interesting thing also is that uh, this ma doesn't really sound like the Turkish mu, mi, mu, mu whatsoever, which we have the vowel harmony. It's ma among all the possibilities. A uh, is not one of the possibilities to realize this question marker. And when you go and deep delve into the stories and into the texts, you end up with something very crucial over here. Um, it seems like the dialect has two very weird negation markers. One is the non-emphatic one, as in 26p, which is the usual negation, not ate the bread, as in chefagatopsomi in 26p. But you can also negate the same sentence with an emphatic form with ma, like ma efagatopsomi with the exact same stress. And the stress is indicated all in the corpus with an accent. Uh, one possibility that comes immediately to mind is that, wait a minute, maybe what I am seeing, in fact, is not necessarily a question marking, but in fact, what I am seeing is um, a question tag that I am really creating with the emphatic negation, like the way the Romance languages does, as in 24 in this under, read, under this reading, the fruit has ripened here, has it not or not immediately? And in fact, the crucial idea is that there is there are two writers in the corpus who always put a very suspicious comma before this question marker. So which already is at least one little piece of information that I could take as very circumstantial evidence, yet an evidence still, that it's not really part of the sentence by itself. Um, true or not, everything is a hypothesis, but at least I think some hypotheses can be better hypotheses than others. Um, the upshot for me was that when I delve into the data, the first thing that I, before making any statement of putting your legs on the couch and saying that why in language I emerged due to contact with another language, you should make sure that why is a real phenomenon. And that doesn't really come for free. You have to really delve into the data and a sound analysis is always a prerequisite, which I'm sure Claudia and Anna are the best people that, you know, like you have to really have a sound synchronic analysis of what you see before going into the details. Uh, this is the first advice that I have. So being a good theoretician or being a good sound analyst is a prerequisite before. Then the second thing in the trivet is the comparandum, what you're really comparing it to. So once you establish that the phenomenon that you see is real, then obviously before even stating that it's contact, you have to take another state of affairs where this why didn't really exist or existed in another different this, uh, format. 
that is essentially the contact that has changed it. Um, in other words, the question is, again, from a diachronic perspective, very relevant question. Am I really comparing the right entities over here? Um, again, we are very much limited in what we see in this context. So essentially what we see over here is just, OK, there is Turkish here and then there is this weird dialect, whatever it can be, Session Arabic, Cappadocian Greek or any last whatsoever. And probably it is closest kin that we have and living extant closed kin that we have. And under these circumstances, jumping to the conclusions are also very, very easy. Just like once, I like reading the origin of spaces every three years I read. So this is why I really, for the first time I found the chance to cite it. I really love it. Uh, it says, I have found it difficult while he's talking about the imperfection of geological record, record I have found it difficult when looking at two species to avoid picturing to myself forms directly intermediate between them. But this is a whole false view. We should always look for forms intermediate between each species and the common unknown progenitor. Uh, your comparisons that you do in a horizontal way may not really lead to the good solutions, actually, if you're really looking at things. I mean, these goes without saying, obviously, but I really want to emphasize this and illustrate this with another thing. Uh, for so many years, both from a theoretical perspective and also from a functional perspective, whatever you call it, and all, almost every introductory book to language context cites this, that the relative clauses are predominant in Cappadocian because of contact with Turkish. Immediate assumption is that there was one stage of the language where relative clauses were postnominal, that is, they followed their nouns, but they changed their order simply because they were in contact. This language was in contact with, with Turkish. The examples, the relevant example is 27. Uh, as you see over here, Duran Sipadishahus, which is the relative clause, you can translate this like that the king saw. And then whatever it modifies, the boy comes after. Like, and the translation is the boy that the king saw arrived, or the boy whom the king saw arrived. Um, and when you compare it to 28, easily you can see the similarity, like isomorphism between the two languages. Again, obviously, this is the only way of making relative clauses in Turkish that you have to put them before the noun. The, the same translation, the boy whom the king saw but the whom the king saw comes before. Uh, now, obviously, th these things tends up to, uh, this thing becomes very logical when you take the living extant species that today that you can really compare Cappadocian with. It can be modern Greek or any other dialect that is essentially in the continental, well, in the, in the mainland Greece or in southern Italy, Immediately the same format will appear to Pevi, Topioi, Vasilias, where the noun is first and then the relative clause comes. The idea goes as such, just like in all these things that I have cited over here, that essentially as if the structure that modern Greek has has been contaminated with Turkish, and then what we have is the Cappadocian format that we have. But wait a minute, are we now uh really comparing the two things in this schema like is it really is there a direct relation or any relationship can be provided with modern greek and cappadocian and for this you have to go to the entire grammar of cappadocian to be able to do this and what you in fact see that a lot of features that cappadocian has today go back to the sixth and the seventh century you can really date them and in fact that's more or less the time when we people talk about the formation of an eastern koine in eastern anatolia and all the way into levant which is is almost a complete different dialect group than modern greek as it is spoken in 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 greece or in southern italy and when you look at all these dialects the number of these prenominal relative clauses together with exact same relativizers is abundant, so much so that they are almost, uh, uh, oh, they, they are overwhelming um, majority, in fact. Now, there is a lot of theoretical thing over here, why essentially 
this is really the input structure for what we see in Cappadocian. But just the take home is that comparison with anything that's not correct would not really lead to this ideal conclusion. Why in Eastern coin the relative clauses come before the noun, as in here, the jars that you see or that you see the jars is an entirely different question. But the problem is, in the seventh century, there was no Turkish around to be able to put any input to the structure. And the same thing with other dialects of Asia Minor can be really very beautifully verified. Now, once you take the grammar of these dialects as a as a complete picture, suddenly you can really disentangle a lot of things. And then you make uh, your comparison when you make your comparandum uh, well, comparanda well, then the things might not really turn out to be the way that you want them to be. Another example that I want to say, sorry, I said there will be a lot of data, don't misunderstand me. Um, I'm always giving you as if I'm criticizing things, but uh, it's not actually. These are all beautiful work that I'm really giving you that creates further questions. Another thing is, in Western Rumeli, which is the Balkans all the way to southern uh, Macedonia and the eastern Bulgaria, in Western Bulgaria, there are quite a lot of Turkish dialects that are being spoken. And the interesting thing about these dialects is that, again, in relative clauses, but in this context, let's call it embedded clauses, as in 31a. Here, I am trying to say the province where I was born in, Vilayet, and then Bandod. The thing is, uh, there's almost a stochastic uh, random distribution between when you put a genitive and when you omit this in the subject of the embedded clause. For many speakers, Ben Dodum Vilayet, the province I was born in, or Benim Dodum Vilayet, with the genitive, the province I was born in, seems to be both fine. Here, I gave you real, real examples from the corpus. This is why the we and I are different. But the important point is with the pronoun, the genitive can appear or not. Uh, but it essentially significantly differs from uh, Turkish of Anatolia, because in Turkish of Anatolia, you cannot omit the genitive. It has to be there. It's grammatically there, obviously. So you can't just omit this. Now, immediately the problem comes. How did it happen? Well, quite a lot of people think that the decay of subject marking in, in these embedded uh, sentences is because of contact with Indo-European languages, which don't really mark genitive on their subjects. Well, at least Macedonian doesn't. It just has a nominative on the embedded subjects. And then because people are bilingual, they tend to forget to put the genitive or they tend to, let's say the genitive is in decay. Uh, this is great, but what we found with a master student of mine is that obvious idea, the Turkish in Rumeli has been spoken there since the late 14th century. It's not like they just moved there yesterday when Turkish has become Turkish. And then the moment you compare it with modern Turkish, probably you're doing something wrong. And we wanted to check this. And we thought maybe it would be interesting to look at what has happened to Turkish of Anatolia in the past. And what we have found out is that the embedded genitives in the history of Turkish from the 13th to 14th century all the way today, here over here, it is the relative clauses, and it's almost always low 50%. So it's almost like a stochastic chance. You can or you don't have to put, you can, but it's not obligatory. Basically, the genitive is not obligatory on the pronouns. They do become, however, like their number starts increasingly, exponentially increase only after the 17th century, the middle 17th century. And then 100 years later, the complement to verbs follow, as in, I thought that you would come where you would put the genitive on the you. So they started with this one. Um, and now today, it's almost like completed actually well we don't have the very modern one and the interesting thing is this stochastic variation is not that stochastic what happens is uh there seems to be a slight tendency whether the referent of the noun that you see all the way until the 17th century uh, 
whether it is animate or inanimate really has some saying on whether you will put genitive or not. So animates seem to be tend to be marked in the genitive more. But what our idea is, what has changed in Turkish is that after the 17th century, uh, what changes is this genitive marking, which seems to at least uh, relatively com correlate with the animacy hierarchy entirely changed to another hierarchy, which we call the definiteness hierarchy. And since the pronouns sit at the very top of the definiteness hierarchy, that if you are familiar with it, it only falls very well that they have to be marked with if you have something to be marking. Uh, the details are not really important. This has nothing to do with contact. But the important thing for us is that we're comparing two wrong entities. We're not, we shouldn't be able to, we shouldn't be comparing Western Rumelian Turkish with the modern Turkish. It only makes sense if you can compare it to the older versions. Like as in early Anatolian Turkish of the 16th century, you can have Senid Dün Kabihishleri, which means the evil disyudit without the genitive, or Senun Tapdun Tanrı from a, the same century, you can have this stochastic. And it seems like uh, only from this perspective and also from the historical perspective that these people have been relocated to these places from Anatolia, starting from the 14th century, but real movements started only in the late 15th century. Probably the dialect that they are speaking is some sort of an extension to the early Anatolian Turkish and not necessarily the modern Turkish. And then, of course, all the other things that we have in their phonology also falls very well from this angle. Uh, the thing is that we the second thing that we have to look at is that we keep in mind that we should make sure that we are looking at the right direction. Not necessarily comparing apples and oranges, so probably you also know this. And the third thing is that once we have all these two things, the last part of the trivet is, is what I really see genuinely contact induced. Now, a lot of part or bigger part of this answer will come next, but now I will just want to introduce you. Again, we have very limited vision. And again, Darwin, what he says, I look at the geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept and written in a changing dialect. Of this history, we possess the last volume alone. And of this volume, only here and there has a chapter been preserved. And of each page, only here and there a few lines. And each word may represent the forms of life which falsely appear to have been abruptly introduced. Not necessarily, but the problem is we have an incredible fragmentary evidence in our hand. There's very, very little data. And I very much agree with Thomason when we apply it to contact. In spite of the dramatic progress we have in the recent decades, it remains true that we have no adequate explanation for the vast majority of all linguistic changes discovered. We may never know. And for many of them, we really do miss even the basic socio-historical data let alone the linguistic record. This, the, the, the record is terribly impartial. Yet, we still have it in mind that contact is a source of linguistic change. And I will just skip this one and go immediately to the quest, to the example that I have. What can we do if we have very little data? Well, how to be creative in fact. And I will try to illustrate it with another set of data. Um, that is the again, one of the Greek dialects that I have worked on, in which we have differential object marking, which essentially means that these dialects suddenly has this thing that the direct objects come in two guises. It can come in the nominative, as in 34, or in the accusative, but it also has some correlate. The nominative appears only when the object is an indefinite noun phrase, as in, I look for an iron monger. It can be a specific one or any iron monger do. It doesn't really matter. To the extent that it's an indefinite noun phrase, the noun appears in the nominative. But the moment you know the referent of the demirji, which means the iron monger, it comes in the accusative, as if I am looking for the iron monger. Um, it's completely absent in Romaica or Pontic in any other Greek dialect to the best of you know. And also when we compare it to medieval, post-classical, the seventh century Greek that we said, it really doesn't exist anywhere. But it does exist in one other form in Turkish, obviously. So which Turkish is known about this differential object marking? You can mark an object 
either with the nominative, which doesn't have an overt exponent, or with an accusative, and it makes a huge difference in the meaning. So the first one means I'm looking for an ironmonger with the non nominative form. And over here, you're like some sort of in there is some indifference to the ID identity of the ironmonger. Any ironmonger would do. As long as he's an ironmonger, it's okay. We call these the non-specific ones. But once you're talking about the specific ones, as in I am looking for a specific ironmonger, someone I know, but probably you don't know, then you have to add this accusative. And we know that in Turkish, it is present in this very format. This correlates being specificity, at least from the 13th century. And now we have at least a comparanda clear. This comes out from uh, the definiteness hierarchy, what we have. Uh, the Turkish accusative takes into its scope in this monotonic hierarchy, the indefinite specifics, but also, of course, it entails that definite ones, names, proper names and pronouns have to always carry the accusative marking. Turkish only excludes the non-specific ones that is here in 36. Greek, on the other hand, targets a smaller portion of this even, that is the pronouns, names and definites only. And it also leaves indefinite specifics unmarked. Now, what? it's hard to deny that there is some role of Turkish here. Now, essentially, the context is over there. Now, it is time to answer how and what has happened. And now you have to use your imagination. Well, some people have stated this in terms of proportional analogy. Well, what they said is like, at one point in time, sentient Greek speakers being Greek speakers and also knowing Turkish, identified the accusative with the Turkish accusative and the Greek accusative, the Greek nominative with the Turkish nominative. And they also saw in Turkish that accusative comes with specificity and nominative comes with non-specificity. They went back to their own language and they said, <coughs> okay, if we use it in Turkish with the specifics, the accusative, then probably I can use it for the definites. Henceforth, I can also use the nominative for the indefinites. Now, uh, how these people made this analogy, what factor was out there? Was it deliberate? What what was exactly there? It's it's a good story, in fact. But when you go into the details, you just get lost. Why on earth in Farish it's definiteness and Turkish specificity? Whereas other Greek dialects, as in here, the, the dark part, they remain with the accusative with both definites and indefinites. Um, <coughs> what I had in mind was like, wait, we have to ask what has happened first, just to take the, the things right. Information is very fragmentary, but collecting them probably will lead somewhere. The earliest text that is written in this dialect that we know that they called it the dialect of Farisha is very recent, only the first half of the 19th century by which time already the differential object marking was part of the grammar. It was already there. If you go back to the history, what we know is that from the 11th to the 15th century, there is no Turkish villages around it. There is no <coughs> um, uh, long-term settlements that have been referred to anywhere. We know, of course, that some big neighboring cities have been had been plundered before, say the Kesaria, which is like 60 kilometers, was plundered and it was already in ruins in the first crusades. But there were no active settlements. And we know that the first Turkish village names around it, around this area, started to appear from the 15th century. on. And at the same time, the Turkish speaking Orthodox Christians, like the Christians whose language is Turkish, begin to appear in the Western literature around the same, like the late 16th, 16th, uh, 15th century. And also what we know is that this region that we call Farasha comprises seven villages in at least 19, in the early 19th century. All but one village have been uh, established by the colonists from the bigger village. So there is one major village and the six colonies of them, each around 20 kilometers far, simply because the village becomes big and then there are not many fields anymore to work on. And then they say, okay, these families go and they establish another village like 20 kilometers afar. And the first of them was established in 1720s. 
and exactly the same colony was listed as completely turcophone in the eight in the 19 in the early 19th century so between 1720 and 1835 this village became entirely turkish speaker they still kept kept their uh, kinship relations between between these villages, but some of them became Turkish speakers, but the major village still remained the Greek speaker with the biggest population. Combining all these facts and a couple of more, what we end up is that, okay, the context started probably in the 15th century and it was not climax between the 18th and the 20th centuries. So it's around 14 generations between the start of the context to when we see the nominative accusative, that is the differential object marking. That's a lot of generations to really alter the all facts. Um, but in order to understand what has happened, we have to also look at this fragmentary data. It's not essentially the differential object marking that has emerged only. Uh, what essentially happened is that there is a massive, massive uh, restructuring in the entire morphology of these language. Now, what we know on the left-hand side of every Greek dialect is that this nominative accusative distinction, the case distinction, that the cases that are visible, they are visible on the nouns of both masculine and feminine and singular and plural, which means like masculine and feminine singular and plural nouns in whichever Hellenic dialect you go historically or today, they differentiate between nominative and accusative. And so is the definite article of the masculine and the feminine. They also differentiate nominative accusative. So is the indefinite article differentiating between nominative and accusative. And the adjectives which agree with the noun also differentiate always the nominative accusative distinction. The thing is, what we see over here, already in the late medieval Greek, we see the loss of this nominative accusative distinction in the dialect around the region. And in the 19th century, what we end up is that this nominative accusative distinction seems to be retained only on masculine singular nouns and a definite article. So essentially only these two sets make a distinction between the nominative and accusative. But when you look at how people learn things, well, how do you learn morphology or how do you learn case assignment, all you need is input. You need sufficient input to learn the distinction between nominative and accusative. If your input is not there, probably things can go wrong. The second thing is, remember, it's only masculine ones here that separate the nominative accusative. But what happened to nominatives and um, to masculines then? It's not only that, but there is also a significant restructuring of the gender categories. Many feminine and masculine nouns were relocated to the neuter. So the neuter ones always taking the upper hand. And a lot of borrowed words from Turkish, but they are not necessarily put into masculine or anything, they have been put into neuter, so much so that those nouns which do not distinguish nominative and accusative have been the gross dominant, in so much so that in singular indefinite bare noun phrases, 71% of them are always ambiguous between nominative and accusative. So when you hear them, you don't know whether it is marking nominative or accusative. In the plural ones, the number is even worse. But remember, to be able to differentiate between nominative and accusative as a language learner, you need the data to hear first. If there is not enough sufficient input, you can end up with ambiguity. And once ambiguity is there, you can end up with the reanalysis. In which case, the acquirer observes that the nominative and accusative forms of the neuter and feminine, as well as masculine plurals, they are non-distinct when they are indefinite. If most of them are non-distinct, the easy way, one of the easy ways is that this non-distinctiveness can be generalized to all indefinite noun phrases, even including those with masculine singular nouns. This is one possibility, but not enough by itself. Then here comes a lot of other things. One of them is the borrowing from Turkish. <clears throat> there are lots of words from Turkish origin that we know historically in the dialects. Say in the late 19th century, I found a dictionary out of almost like 2,000 words, but more than 2,000 words, 34% are of Turkish origin of all the nouns. 
But the thing is, it's not only nouns that have been borrowed. There are also a lot of verb object idioms, like long translations. Essentially, you take them as chunks, calks basically, like in Turkish, haket, right to, which has a very unique idiomatic meaning, which means deserve. And exactly the same thing you have in Farasha. They use their own verb, ftenu. Hachi is the Turkish word. Do right is exactly the same meaning that deserve. Now, the name, the number of such uh, verb object chunks is abundant. Quite a lot of, in quite a lot of them, this object part is either neutral or feminine. That's okay. But the important thing is always, always bear. You cannot really make them definite. They're always indefinite by themselves. While 71% of them are neutral feminine, 29 are in fact masculine. <coughs> so what you have is like in 40 here, phtaniolchis, which means make someone traveler, do traveler, which means send somebody off. It's essentially the same call from Turkish, yolcet. Um, the idea that I had was like, if such verb objects were borrowed by adults or created by adults in the first place to ensure exact calking, uh, these adults must have brought in the trigger for the nominative in all bare indefinite direct object context for the next generation. So the thing is, even if you have a very small limited number of these nominative cases to render exact specific meaning of the Turkish idiomatic chunks, it's already enough to provide a further ambiguity for the next generation of learners to say that, okay, wait a minute, nominative is taking the upper hand in indefinite. Um, if this is really on the right track, we should expect that the very earlier nominative accusative confusion in the data should appear in this verb object idiomatic context. Well, we don't have the data. We don't have the data, I'm sorry. But yet we have a data from a very neighboring village, which is around 45 kilometers. This is the dialect, dialect of Sile. When you go back to the exact same texts from exact time, by the way, this dialect has died out. Unfortunately, when they moved to Greece, they died in the early 20th century. But right before the 20th century, the late 19th century texts, when you look, um, what you see is like, they do not have DOM, differential object marking, in any context, but only in verb object idioms, when they are taken from Turkish. So you see the nominative in these bare things, only in these do sanctification with the light verb form, and the noun that is borrowed from Turkish. So such a small number of things is already enough to contaminate the system uh, <coughs> in which the nominative accusative ambiguity was already there. Um, the rest is not really very interesting. Uh, what we didn't really trust this whole story and we wanted to really run also some simulations exactly trying to replicate everything. Okay, what we have, definite MPs, what we have, indefinite MPs. And we try to scale it into our data and we try to use the simulation with the abduction tolerable uh, of tolerable productivity. It's like a decision tree model and you really simulate like 100 children receiving the same input, trying to control all these variables, reduced um, morphological distinction, and a couple of uh, such verb object idiom chunks. And what we essentially found out is that <coughs> this ATP can really learn the Farashot Greek type of thumb very quickly in less than like 20 generations once the total number of this frequency of the verb object chunk reaches a very small threshold. If you have like around 16% of these, like just a couple of these verb object idiom chunks with the nominative, that's enough to get. The system broken. <coughs> Sorry, it was too too much. Um, now, the last thing that I wanted to say is that the answer to the question, what happened, it really requires a lot of ingenuity, a lot of delving into all possible sources of information. Places you go may not be correct. And also, the answer that you have eventually and probably is not going to be correct but it definitely will be a better option than just saying saying oh it's just so you know it's just because of contact at least you create some challengeable hypothesis essentially this is how science works so you have to say something that you can challenge 
nobody is going to challenge you if you say differential object marking is from Turkish. So that's all I could really say. And next time I think I'm going to talk about how we can make generalizations from the output that we have. Oh, thank you so much. I think that's finished.